through of Renaissance, we'll try to make it all the way to the Baroque. Uh, remember, for every image, you want to be able to fully identify it. Two of those will give you a point. We always want to know the function, and then it's helpful to know what it's famous for. And uh, then, of course, something on the form or the art. And then a connection or what it's similar to. So we'll go through these uh, quickly and try to find the main, main idea of what they're famous for. First thing, when we go to the Renaissance, we get into some art periods here you just want to be aware of. Proto-Renaissance is just before the Renaissance, Giotto 1300s. Northern Renaissance and Italian Renaissance are at the same time in the 1400s. Italian is the same thing as the early Renaissance, and it's in Florence, Italy. High Renaissance is really three artists, Mike, Leo, and Ralph. Venice and the North are in the 1500s, and Mannerism is also in the 1500s. So we get some painting style in here you want to be aware of. All right, first one is Arena Chapel. That's from the 1300s, and we did this one earlier. What's famous is the art of Giotto, the Lamentation, which is inside the Arena Chapel. It's proto-Renaissance because it's just before the Renaissance. It's got a lot of naturalism. You compare it to the old style. It's much more realistic, much more naturalistic, and has real emotion, and it's inside the Arena Chapel. Okay, Northern Renaissance, we have two works, and they're going to go up here to Bruges in the north the same time as the Italian Renaissance. We've got the Arnolfini portrait, and it's known for um, this one. Generally, the north is known for hidden symbols and oil paint. This is a very interesting work here. It has some religious symbols, but we're not sure what the purpose was. It might have been a wedding contract or some kind of legal, legal contract, but it's a good example of Northern Renaissance painting. Another one is the Marode altarpiece, and this shows the Annunciation of Gabriel, the angel, visiting Mary. Again, it's northern, so it has the symbols. It's got the flowers and the candle, and it tells the story of the Annunciation. So it's a biblical story, and it is um, a private devotional uh, um, object. Okay, now we'll get to the early Renaissance or the Italian Renaissance. That's going to be 1400s in Florence, Italy. There it is. They're a small uh, republic, but it had a lot of commerce, and with the commerce, it had a lot of new art. Uh, Brunelleschi, uh, there's his dome, and he does a number of things. He invents linear perspective, but in our uh, curriculum, it's his chapel, the Pazzi Chapel. It's an example of Renaissance architecture. And if you compare it side by side with the Gothic, it's, ge it's, um, it's a rebirth of the classical, so it's math, geometry, order, and side by side you can see the best with Chartres Cathedral, the contrast. If you look at the ceiling, circle, geometry, dome, simplicity, math, order, contrast that with the Gothic verticality. Another one is the Pal Palazzo Ruccelli, that's a house, and it's also uh, Renaissance, and Alberti is a very famous architect. He actually took the Colosseum pilasters and put them on this house. This house is very similar to the Medici house, and again, you can see the difference side by side with the Gothic, math, order, versus verticality of chart. Uh, then we get to the famous statue, David, by Donatello, and here we have the rebirth of the Renaissance. It's a biblical story of David and Goliath, but done with Renaissance form, the first classical nude since Doriforos. And uh, you can see it best side by side, naturalism, idealism, contraposta, and humanism. The idea that humans make things happen. If you look at it, it's, the focus is on the body, uh, not the soul. The medieval view is that the body was corrupt. Here the body is celebrated. And there he is standing on Goliath. He just cut his head off. Uh, and it reminds us of uh, Johnny Depp and Pirates of the Caribbean. All right, now Renaissance painting, Madonna and Child with Two Angels. Here the big thing on the painting is um, painting just really quickly. We have two-dimensional of the Egyptians. Uh, we have the vase paintings of the Greeks. The Romans had some depth. But the early Renaissance is famous for linear perspective. Same thing as a mathematical perspective. It uses lines and orthogonals to create a perfect illusion. Side by side, you can see the difference. Perfect illusion here of linear perspective of the Italians versus the Northern Renaissance. They would take a vanishing point in the back, draw orthogonals, and then they would uh, make their painting create a perfect illusion. That's really the famous thing of Renaissance painting. All right. Birth of Venus is a Renaissance painting, but this one is really more about uh, Neoplatonic ideas. And Venus, of course, is a goddess. So here you have a Greek goddess in an Italian painting. And Birth of Venus, again, is that, that Renaissance, the rebirth of the classical into the Italian Renaissance. 
and that's Botticelli. Uh, okay, then the, then we get to the Last Supper. We get to uh, Leonardo, Michelangelo, and um, and the the masters of the High Renaissance. This is the Last Supper, and it it captures the moment. Uh, it, so it's a biblical story with a function. It's a biblical story captures the moment when Jesus says, "One of you will betray me." It's famous for being just a masterpiece perfection of painting. Uh, he did the Mona Lisa, he did Sfumato, he did Chiaroscuro, and he creates a perfect, balanced illusion. There was the original purpose here. It was a, a painting where um, monks would look at when they ate. It was in the cafeteria, so the Last Supper was quite appropriate there. And then he, what he was, did was Leonardo was able to paint the soul, not just the way the body looked, but the intention of the soul, and he does it with groups, he does it with faces. And here you see the, um, the vanishing point is a halo behind his head, and it's just, a, it's just balanced, stable, perfect linear perspective, perfect form. And uh, Christ is almost like a triangle of stability in the middle. Then we get to the Sistine Chapel. It's got four images, the chapel, the, the sibyl, the flood, and the Sistine Chapel. It's probably the, it's considered the greatest work of art of all time. Uh, the Vatican, of course, they call it Rome. It's Vatican City is inside Rome, so we're out of Florence now. Now we're in Rome. There's the Vatican, and then there is the chapel. All right, Michelangelo, really quickly, was a sculptor. That's his Pieta, and that's his David, and he was such an amazing sculptor. Um, then he became a painter of the Sistine Chapel, which he really didn't want to do, but he did. He painted the whole thing by himself. And the first thing is the overall story. It's the story from the Old Testament, from the beginning of the man to, of man to the corruption of man. So it's a Catholic church, but it's basically a Jewish story. Why does he do that? He's telling God's plan. So that is the layout of the whole story. Uh, there is God's creating the universe, creating the sun, creating man, and uh, then man sins, gets thrown down to earth, then they're, they're, they're so awful, there's a flood, and God wipes everybody out in the flood, but then God will save uh, the chosen people. All right, famous for the flood is probably, and for the whole thing, is Michelangelo does Greek style. The bodies look Hellenistic. The bodies are beautiful. Remember, the, the, the Christian view was the body was corrupt. Michelangelo uses the body to celebrate humanity. So the bodies look Hellenistic. The other image is the Sybil. This is like a Hebrew psychic. And if you look at her, look at her body, she looks like a strong Greek man. And that's the model he used. So once again, Michelangelo is famous for using classical, pardon me, Hellenistic Greek beauty in a Christian story. And that's that. Okay, and then Raphael is the third master. He was famous for doing Jesus and his mom, but School of Athens, by the way, School of Athens, Last Supper, and Sistine Chapel, you want to know those really, really well. I would re-watch the con videos. You want to know, be ready to write about one of those. Then there's School of Athens, which is basically a celebration of Western knowledge from Plato and Aristotle and all the great thinkings. The function was, it was in the Pope's library. So in the library of the Pope's wall, you have something celebrating not religious people, but thinkers, great philosophers throughout time. On the one side, it's the, um, the, 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 the scientific side of math and astronomy. And the other side, and then this is Plato pointing up, Aristotle pointing down. And then the other side is more of the artsy types, and that's, of course, Michelangelo, who was added to the painting later. All right, those are the big masters. Now there's a couple lesser movements that you want to be aware of. First one is Venice. Venice is more secular, and this is Venus of Urbino, and this is the, uh, the, the Venice painters were into color, and um, this is um, Venus of Urbino. It's the female nude, the recumbent nude, and we'll come back to more of this later in the 20th century. And then in the north, there was a guy named Durer. He was the Leonardo of the north. He stuttered in Italy. And this is Adam and Eve. And this is famous for, if you look at the bodies, it's in the north, but it looks Italian Renaissance. So he uses Italian Renaissance or classical nudity in his northern paintings. That's Durer. And he did prints. So he had multiple copies, and he made a lot of money. Another northern one is the Eisenheim altarpiece, and this is famous for, um, it's an altarpiece, so it'd be, and it was also in a hospital that was there to kind of cheer people up. Uh, this one's famous for how brutal it is. Uh, Jesus really is suffering here. It's really, really tough. It is not romanticized. It's gruesome. It's disgusting. But it has a happy ending because it opens up, and it opens up into the resurrection. Now we're going to get into religious warfare here. The north is going to fight the south. So you have religious wars everywhere. Allegory of law and grace 
basically tells the story of the Protestant view of salvation, the Catholics versus the Protestants. Mannerism in the 1500s is a nice way to wrap up the 1500s because mannerism is the opposite of the Renaissance. It's odd proportions, off balance, opposite, weird, weird colors. And if you just look at it side by side with the, uh, with the Last Supper, you can see the contrast pretty clearly. And then front piece of Codus Mendoza is where we will stop. We'll pick up on this one on the next one.